Longer Wacky Stories with Twist Endings by John M. W. Smith Dedication I would like to dedicate this book to my friend and advisor, Katrina Komisarova, whose kind words of encouragement have inspired me to write the following stories. A Social Handicap It was Paula's one big handicap in life. A great disadvantage, both in her career prospects and in her social life. Her friends made fun of her because of it. They made her feel small and inferior, unfit for normal society. Their constant teasing was wearing Paula down to breaking point. She wanted them to stop, to accept her as she was. And what was Paula's handicap? Simple. Paula didn't drink. No, she would never allow alcohol to pass her lovely lips. Men like women who are fun, her friends would say. Women who don't drink are boring. And then, what chance have you of ever finding a man if you are no fun? They weren't interested in why Paula didn't drink. Of how, when she was only seven years old, her mother died and her father took to drink. He drank so heavily that he himself was dead within six months and she was placed in a foster home. Her foster parents were kind and looked after her well, but she never forgot the way she had loved her own parents. It was bad enough losing her mum, but she should never have lost her dad and it was all because of drink, she told herself. So Paula swore she would never drink. But times change. People grow up. Maybe she should reconsider her decision never to drink, wondered Paula. It was certainly no fun being a social outcast. Her friends had stopped inviting her out. She had become sad and lonely. Getting home every evening from her office job. Nothing to look forward to, other than the flickering screen of her television set and the purring body of her cat beneath her left hand on the sofa. And then... It was New Year's Eve again. And this time, her friends took pity on her and did invite her to a house party. Paula was very happy to be invited. All she could hope for was that her friends would know her well enough by now to respect her wishes not to drink. It began well. Her friends greeted her warmly. There were many young men present. Paula became happy. Her normally still face creasing into smiles and making her look pretty. Unfortunately, all of this changed when her friends were well into their third or fourth drinks. Paula, you're being a spoil sport, said Jenny, the girl who worked in accounts. Minutes later, Jenny got asked for a dance and began whirling around on the dance floor, drink in one hand and cigarette in the other. 
You'll never get noticed if you never let yourself go. Lily from Personnel said to Paula. Lily tossed her head back to finish her drink. Then she got up and staggered towards a young man. He looked surprised, but then began grinning when Lily flung herself into his arms, asking him to dance. Paula stared miserably at the great big lipstick mark on Lily's empty glass. Everyone was having such fun. No one was bothering with her. Poor sober Paula. Such a bore. A surge of bitter anger rose to the back of Paula's throat. And all because I don't drink, she fumed. Well, no one was going to change that. Not ever. But surely, just this once, it wouldn't harm to join in the fun. To show her friends, once and for all, that she could be fun if she needed to be. That she was no less a person than any of them. If she did accept a drink, only one, mind, maybe everything would change. The music stopped and all her friends came back. They were chatting and ignored her. The guys whom they had been dancing with went to the bar to fetch them more drinks. The party was getting into full swing. Paula gathered all her courage up. Okay, I'll have a drink. Paula blurted out loudly. All her friends stopped talking and turned to stare at Paula. I said I'll have a drink. Have you all gone deaf? Paula went on. And then everyone was laughing. Paula found a drink in her hand as if by magic. It looked like a double. Her friends all had their eyes glued on her. I'll show them, thought Paula. With an elaborate flourish, she raised the glass to her lips, held her breath, and downed the double gin and tonic in one smooth swallow, before slamming the empty glass down. A great cheer went up around the table. Her friends were clapping. One or two guys had noticed and were looking at her as if impressed. The gin and tonic hit Paula's stomach like the kick of a mule. A soft buzzing began in her head. See? She asked her friends defiantly. A guy with bad teeth and a large, bold patch asked Paula for a dance. She didn't care for him. All she cared about was that a guy had taken notice of her at last. So Paula danced, trying not to look at the guy too much. Then she noticed with a start that someone had handed her another drink. It wasn't easy to dance with a drink in one hand. So Paula downed this drink too, in one long swallow. Now Paula began feeling dizzy. Excuse me, I don't feel too good. I must sit down, she said to her dancing partner. The guy looked disappointed. He thought it was his lucky night, 
for Paula was a good-looking girl. Too good-looking for him, anyway. Never having had a drink before, this was a completely new experience for Paula. It all felt so strange. In a way, it felt nice. But in a way, it scared her. Because she didn't seem in full control of herself anymore. And this was a feeling that she didn't like. She thought of her real dad, who had lost all control of himself and had ended up dead. Suddenly, Paula had had enough. She wanted out of there, away from her so-called friends, away from the grinning, sweaty guys who danced with them. The way Paula was feeling now, she had started longing for her familiar sofa, the flickering television set, and her cat purring beside her. Thank you all, but I don't feel well. So I'd better get on home now, said Paula, as she swayed to her feet when her friends returned from the dance floor. They started persuading her to stay and have another drink. It will make you feel better. You wait and see. One of them said. But Paula didn't listen. She was aware of their amused looks as she totted out of the room and let herself out of the house. Far from her problems being over, Paula quickly discovered that they were only just beginning. For the first time, the windscreen of her car appeared cloudy, and she decided to give it a good clean the next day. And her foot kept slipping off the accelerator. Obviously, the pedal was worn out, and it would need to be changed. And it was really dark outside. Paula had never known an August night to look so dark before. Everything had become very scary, and Paula didn't like it at all. Right there and then, she decided that it had been a huge mistake to drink. Okay, it was all right for her friends. It seemed to make them happy, but it definitely didn't make her feel happy. With her moist hands gripping the steering wheel tightly, Paula swore she would never drink again. If only her luck allowed her to get home without trouble. But it was not to be. Halfway from home, two big blue lights started flashing in her rear-view mirror. Oh no! Paula groaned. The police! They would smell the drink on her breath. She would lose her license. She would also lose her job, because she needed to drive at work, to visit clients, on behalf of her employer. And all because of one silly mistake. Paula pulled over to the side of the road, shaking all over. The police car stopped in front. A tall figure got out. But why was it so dark everywhere? Paula wound down her window as the policeman came up. Do you know why you have been stopped, madam? A deep voice inquired. Paula 
felt tears in her eyes. Her entire life lay ruined in tatters. I... I only had one drink, she lied. I swear I never drink. I won't ever do it again. I lose my job. Please, officer, can't you let me go? Please, oh, please, say yes. The tall policeman bent down so that his face was level with Paula's. Now that's interesting. I didn't know you had been drinking. I stopped you because you'd forgotten to switch your headlights on. But now, well, now I'll have to breathalyze you to find out just how much you have been drinking. Paula's heart sank right down to the bottom of her high-heeled shoes. She felt sick. She and her big mouth. If only she'd kept it shut, the policeman would have told her to put her lights on. She'd have apologized for the mistake and quietly driven off. Maybe he wouldn't have smelled the liquor on her breath, him being so tall. Will you please step out of your car? The policeman was saying. I'll fetch the breathalyzer. He turned and began walking back to his car. Paula got out of her car. Outside her face felt cold, where the breeze hit the tears running down her cheeks. She would beg. She would plead. She would do anything. She had glimpsed the policeman's face. It was a kind face. And his aftershave, well, the aroma was simply divine. He was the kind of man you could feel safe with, Paula decided. He would listen. Paula began following the policeman to his car. She began to call out brokenly. He completely ignored her. Just then, another car went by. And then another. Paula glimpsed the driver of the first car, looking over his shoulder, to see what was going on at the side of the road. The driver of the second car did the same. And then there was an almighty crash as the second car went into the back of the one in front. Paula heard the policeman curse under his breath. And then he was running towards the two cars as the drivers got out, dazed and unsteady. Now, thought Paula, Right now, this was her chance, her only one chance. She would quickly get into her car and leave while the policeman was busy. With a soft whimper, Paula turned out and backed away, her eyes never leaving the three figures on the other side of the road. Easy now? No sudden moves, quietly does it. Her luck was in. She managed to get inside behind the steering wheel. Her left hand pushed the automatic gear shift to drive with her right foot on the brake. Now, go for it! Paula plunged the accelerator to the floorboards and the car shot away like a rocket. Too fast even for the policeman to get a look at her number plate. Paula was sure of that. He hadn't been quick enough to turn around. 
And now she was a criminal, running away from the police. If she got caught, she could go to jail. Forget losing her license and her job. With great sobs wrecking her slender body, Paula pulled into the driveway, opened her car door, staggered into her house past her surprised-looking cat and into the bathroom. There, her whole body convulsed with fear and the effects of alcohol. And she got sick. Over and over again. Never again, she sobbed. To hell with her friends. She hadn't been happy with her loneliness, but at least she'd been safe. After what seemed like a long time, Paula stopped getting sick. She washed her face. Then she went to her bedroom and changed into clean clothes. Occasionally, a little sob still escaped her. And then she went to the kitchen to make some coffee, where she glanced out of the kitchen window and felt her breath whoosh out as her legs almost buckled underneath her. It was the police. Lights flashing outside. That policeman must have seen her number plate after all. It was over. A strange calm seemed to come over Paula. Idly she wondered what it would be like inside a jail. Yes, that very same policeman was at her door, knocking. She could see him, too, through the window. Paula undid the door latch and opened the door. I'm sorry, officer. I'll take whatever is coming to me. She said as she looked up into the policeman's face. He really was so very good looking. Now here was a man she could really go for who would see to it that she was never lonely again. Of all the bad, bad luck in the world. Paula wished that the ground would open beneath her and swallow her up. Then she realized that the policeman was still standing looking down at her. He hadn't moved. He hadn't even said a word. What was going on? Out of the corner of her eye, Paula noticed something else. Now this was really puzzling. Her own car was actually parked behind the police car in her driveway. Um, it's not as simple as that. The policeman finally said. My name is Kevin, by the way. Um, you ran away, but you took my car. Not your own. Ah! Now Paula nearly fainted. Her knees gave way, so that the policeman was forced to catch her in his strong arms before she hit the ground. She'd stolen a police car to get away on top of everything else. Look, Kevin the policeman was saying, as he held Paula in his arms, close against his chest. I'll make a deal with you. I can't afford to let anyone know that you managed to drive off in my car. I'd be laughed out of the police force. I'll forget about everything, if you will do the same. It took a few moments for his words to sink in. And there they stood, holding each other close. 
staring into each other's eyes as Paula's breath slowly steadied, even though her heart was still racing. Okay, it's a deal. She mumbled with the sad smile that was forming on her lips. But I don't think I'll ever be able to forget you, Kevin. And now Kevin began to smile, a smile that warmed Paula to the inside of her body, better than any drink could. In that case, how about dinner sometime at the weekend, Paula? You know my name, she whispered. It wasn't difficult to find out, seeing as you'd left your own car behind. I had to drive it back home to you, laughed Kevin. Thanks for the invitation, said Paula. Dinner would be nice, on one condition. Please don't expect me to drink. Kevin nodded. You don't need to drink to have men find you attractive, he whispered. Mrs. Cheadle goes shopping. Come on, love, give us a kiss, yelled the lad with the spiky hair, his scrawny neck poking worm-like from his open leather jacket. He threw an empty beer can. It clattered across the concrete and hit Mrs. Cheadle's tired old ankles painfully. How dare you! She spluttered helplessly, just managing to keep her balance. Drawing her handbag up to her chest, she turned to face her antagonist squarely. A girl whose purple and black makeup heightened her corpse-like appearance, detached herself from the group and moved forward menacingly. Mrs. Cheadle's alert blue eyes scanned the youngster's face for some spark of warmth, some shred of decency. She found none. Stinging ankles forgotten, Mrs. Cheadle sped through the doors of the supermarket to sanctuary among the shoppers within. Her breathing quick and shallow, Mrs. Cheadle dotted up the center aisle to hide herself. Reaching a slim, blue-veined hand to grasp the side of a chiller cabinet, she leaned against it bending her head to remove her misted-up glasses, which she wiped with a small, lace-streamed hanky. After a few minutes, she felt better and nodded decisively. The manager, he was the one to see. A gum-chewing sales girl at Green Groceries pointed out his office. Reaching the door, Mrs. Cheadle knocked and entered. A harassed-looking young man looked up. She introduced herself politely and sat down. When he appeared in no hurry to offer her a chair. The young today she thought despairingly. Five minutes later, Mrs. Cheadle was shaking her head in disbelief. But surely you can do something. This is your property. What would your bosses say if you knew you were letting those louds drive trade away? I've tried, love. Believe me. I've had the police around to move them on, but it was no use. In exasperation, the manager rubbed a hand along his weak-looking jawline. 
A day later, they were back again. When I went home that evening, I found they'd smashed both my car headlights. After that, well, I just sort of gave up. Sweat beaded his receding hairline as he leaned back. Suddenly, Mrs. Cheadle felt sorry for the manager. He was but a mere lad himself. How could he manage this huge place? As well as fight running battles with the thugs outside. Mrs. Chiddle sighed. I'll be off now, but I certainly intend giving the police a piece of my mind. But the middle-aged red-cheeked sergeant at the police station simply blew out his cheeks and sighed after she made her complaint. What would you have us do, my dear? You know, there's only so far we can go without ending up breaking the law ourselves. Even if we charge them, take them to court, or just leave them in a cell for a day or two, what's the use? After a few days, they'll be back again. You can't win. Since the death of her husband, Brigadier James Gordon Cheadle, DSM, memories of his fearless, commanding presence came flooding back. Whenever Mrs. Cheadle met men like the supermarket manager or the sergeant, as she hesitated, a flash of inspiration lit up the policeman's blond features. Look, he began reasonably. Why don't you use another supermarket? There's one just half a mile away from the one you use. And they've got about three entrances. All you've got to do is choose one, where there aren't any louts hanging about. He finished with a smile, pleased at this obviously simple solution. But I like the one we use. I use, she corrected herself. We always used it, when my husband was alive, that is. Now that I'm alone, I see no reason to change, and I like the place. James. He was my husband. He used to so enjoy buying the occasional neat little packet of smoked salmon and, and those little blocks of Danish blue cheese in their shiny wrappers. He knew just where everything was, and so did I. And he was mad about the Stilton. She trailed away her mind going back to their last wedding anniversary, when she had surprised James with a bottle of his favorite malt whiskey and a pound of Stilton cheese, very ripe, the way he liked it. The look he had given her from the depth of his armchair had made her feel young again. As young as they had both been when they had first met, he, a dashing young officer, complete with twirled moustache and a ramrod straight back, he had completely bowled her over at the Christmas ball in the officer's mess. Ahem, <clears throat> coughed the sergeant politely. I all right, my dear? He asked, breaking up her reminiscing. She shrugged her thin shoulders. At the doorway, she paused and looked back. You know, James wouldn't have given up so easily, she murmured. The sergeant stared at her blankly. That night, Mrs. Cheadle dreamed of the old brigadier, 
In their kitchen, she had plopped a knob of butter on the pile of boiled cabbage in a pyrrhic bowl and put it back in the oven. The joint of roast beef, surrounded by glistening new potatoes, was already in there. Closing the door, she turned the heat down low and prepared the gravy boat, ready to take the juices of the cooked meat in a minute or two. First, a glass of sherry with James, a phoned ritual every Sunday lunchtime. She hung up her apron behind the door and walked into the drawing room. But where was he? She glanced around and spied him lying flat on the carpet, infantry in front and artillery cover behind. Enemy in the trenches up front, all lined up before him. Only this time, when he reached out to move a plastic figure, she saw that something was wrong. A build-up of enemy armor had begun on either flank. His troops were in an impossible position, with no way out but to retreat with heavy casualties. He looked up and caught her impression. Surrender? Good heavens, no, old girl, he boomed cheerfully. Remember what I've always told you about strategy. He laughed and rolled over to accept the glass of sherry she was holding out. Some of us use strategy every day of our lives, yet hardly even know it. The more fashionable nowadays call it lateral thinking. But it's all the same, really. You've got to forget your inhibitions and all the rules your life have ever been conditioned by. Think in a way no one would ever believe you could think. He raised his glass and winked up at her. Then... As she regarded him doubtfully, he began moving his troops around, explaining how he would turn certain defeat into victory. When Mrs. Chidula woke, it was still dark, and she wandered out to the kitchen to make a cup of tea. Drawing her late husband's dressing gown tightly around his slight frame, she crept into the drawing room. There she lit the gas fire, installed after the brigadier was no longer around to help light a real fire. Drawing the curtains open, she placed her cup within easy reach. Then she lowered herself into the brigadier's old armchair and stared thoughtfully out at the first streaks of dawn. A couple of hours later, she roused herself, her cup of tea cold and forgotten by her side. It was time to go to the supermarket. So upset had she been the previous day that most of shopping still remained undone. When she was ready to live, she did something unusual. She took out her diamond engagement ring from her dressing table drawer and slipped it on a finger. Outside stood her car, a little, well-kept mini, which had been her husband's last Christmas present to her. But today her hands, usually rock-steady, trembled with a barely suppressed thrill of impatient anticipation. This proved her undoing, as the car wouldn't start. 
Betty Cheadle had flooded the engine. It always happened when she was in a hurry. Waiting for the excess fuel to disperse, she idly toyed with her engagement ring. It was no longer a tight fit. But the diamond still flashed with a deep, white-hot fire that flickered briefly as she held up her gradually steadying hand. A few minutes later, she rode off in a puff of blue smoke. As Mrs. Cheadle swung into the supermarket car park, she nodded once to herself on catching sight of the group of young layabouts in their usual sport. Today they had brought along a tiny radio, which blared out a noise supposed to be music. The chicken-necked boy of the day before was doing a parody of a dance in a drunken to-and-fro stumbling gait, hence punching skywards. Mrs. Cheadle parked and waited. Patiently she began scrutinizing each new arrival, while an occasional burst of obscenities penetrated her car windows from the supermarket entrance. And then, when she had almost given up hope, she saw him. Mrs. Chiddle's skin prickled as she watched the huge giant of a man, red-faced and colicky, lovingly close the door of his expensive sports car. Good morning, tickled Mrs. Cheadle as he lumbered past. Bloodshot eyes swiveled in her direction, the sheer brute force of a man almost palpable even at a distance. Hum, he snorted and moved on frowning. Perfect, breathed Mrs. Cheadle softly winding her window back up again. As soon as the giant's broad back disappeared into the supermarket, she got out and stood very still, her blue eyes raking the car park for any movement. There was none. Better still, the louts weren't looking her way. She walked to the giant's car. What a beauty it was, she thought sadly. Bright and polished, looking every inch as if daily tended with a near religious devotion. She sighed and pretended to drop something. In the act of bending down, her left hand drifted across the driver's door. There was a sound like an old gramophone needle, jolted roughly across the plain surface of a record. What a shame! A deep, ragged groove had suddenly appeared in the pristine paintwork of the car. Wiping flecks of paint from her engagement train, Mrs. Cheadle retired to the comfort of her mini. It seemed a long while before the red-faced man emerged, laden with carrier bags, and sweat pouring from his low forehead. He looked hot and bothered, as though he'd much rather be enjoying a pint of beer and game of darts with his friends. When he got to his car he stopped, as if hitting a brick wall carrier bags dropping from suddenly lifeless arms. A wounded cry rose from deep within him as he squeezed his great fists against either side of his bullet head and a thundering oath burst from his lips, vile enough 
to make Mrs. Chiddles blush as she stepped out of her car. The eyes of a maddened wild boar swung on Mrs. Chiddles tiny figure as she hurried forward, their ferocity bringing her to hold a respectful distance away. She cleared her throat nervously. I see they've done it to yours as well. They just finished on my mini when I got back. Although the scratch isn't as big as the one you've got, she explained. She whirled around, screaming, Bandles! That one word letting loose all her pent-up rage and frustration. As she glared at the group, which had tormented her these past weeks. The effect on the giant was dramatic. Corded veins sprang up like rearing snakes on his darkening forehead. His eyes bulged, and a rumbling like a runaway express train started somewhere deep in his massive chest. Mrs. Cheadle tottered in his slipstream as he hurtled past. He covered the thirty-odd yards to the ground in seconds. As Mrs. Cheadle patted swiftly to her mini, the atmosphere erupted in terrified shouting and screaming, punctuated by sickening thumps. Piteous groans followed. A motorcycle helmet flew up and landed on a parked car. A lad staggered away, retching, his nose bloodied. Another tumbled away, trying desperately to escape, with one arm of his leather jacket almost completely ripped off. A tiny radio whirled up to be promptly silenced on hitting a garbage bin. The giant's fists rose and fell again and again against the blue skyline. Very soon, perhaps too soon, Mrs. Cheadle couldn't help feeling a convoy of blue flashing lights weaved its way to the scene. Policemen emerged, and the something and scuffling gradually died down. Mrs. Cheadle glimpsed the big man, looking remarkably unscathed, being held by four policemen. The girl with the awful makeup was jabbering in excitement to a patiently listened police officer. Eventually, he turned to the big man, who thrust his spade-like chin out to point across the roofs of cars to where Mrs. Cheadle was standing. Time to leave. Mrs. Cheadle quickly got into her car, hurriedly tried to start, and flooded the engine. The police officer was now striding purposefully towards her. He would question her. She needed to stick to her story. Mrs. Cheadle thought sadly of what had to be done. It would be a small price to pay for shopping in peace once more. She opened her door, bringing her left arm over to dangle down its side as she got out. An ugly scored line appeared in her beloved Minnie's paintwork. Gabby the Go-Getter I like strong and clever women. Their company is stimulating. I can sit enthralled by them for hours. They make me feel alive. They rivet my senses. Many men are different. They feel threatened by such women. This is the main reason why my friend Gabby, successful in just about everything imaginable, still remained bereft of a love in her life. 
and although she never liked talking about it, I knew it bothered her. Yes, despite everything she had got, all that she had achieved, Gabby was lonely. Me? Sadly, no. So powerful a lady is Gabby that even I am not man enough to handle her. So that is why we have always been just friends. Yes, good friends in school. Even though nowadays we don't meet up for a coffee as often as we used to. Why? Well, I think it all goes back to one fateful afternoon when we met at a cafe for our once a month rendezvous. The cafe was unusually crowded. Perhaps it was the good weather. Gabby was already there, spotting me instantly and waving even as she conveyed a large mug of frothy cappuccino to her lovely lips. I waved back. To reserve a place for me, Gabby had placed her handbag on the next chair. I only vaguely registered the fact that it was unfastened. Even less did I notice the anonymous, shifty-eyed guy on a nearby stool. A serial entrepreneur, Gabby owned a whole string of businesses and even the cafe we were in. Which is why I hadn't had to pay for the gigantic cafe latte that I carried over to Gabby's table. Don't get me wrong. I'm no freeloader but Alberto, the manager, had told his staff never to accept payment from me. No doubt on Gabby's instructions. As usual, Gabby and I exchanged chaste kisses on the cheek. And as usual, I looked across at Alberto and winked a greeting across to where he sat at his vantage point near to the cash register. Beaming from ear to ear, Alberto winked back. It was a ritual. Then Gabby moved her hand back so I could sit on the chair. She placed it on the floor next to her own chair. The little guy on the stool hadn't moved after catching my eye, and now he looked hurriedly away. He was small, wiry and muscular, with a crappy earring in one ear, wearing a dirty t-shirt with cut-off sleeves and faded jeans torn at the knee. A loser. Some small-time punk. I dismissed him from my mind. Gabby was in her usual irresistibly high spirits, immediately launching into a description of the psychological tactics she had used to clinch yet another lucrative business deal. I listened, genuinely interested, because she could bring wit and fun to even the most boring subject. And the way she had negotiated this deal was anything but boring. Time flew. I don't know how long, as I never cared about the time when I was with Gabby. And then suddenly she glanced aside, then glanced again. Her expression changed. Hey, it's been moved, she muttered. With one swift movement, she had retrieved her handbag off the floor. She began rummaging in it. My purse, it's gone. She looked up and around. 
I was already scanning the sea of faces before us when I saw the Mr. Nobody who had been sitting close to us at the counter. He was hiding unhurriedly, but purposely to ford the exit. Gabby saw him a heartbeat later. I bet it's him, she whispered. I've got another cell phone. He doesn't know that. Watch carefully, John. Here we go now. I was used to Gabby's mind, moving at lightning speed. Thank goodness my own mind is only marginally slower. So I had no trouble grasping what was going on. In the purse that Mr. Nobody had taken from Gabby's handbag was a cell phone. But there was a second cell phone in Gabby's handbag. And in a flash she had dialed the number of the cell phone lying within her stolen purse. Its musically wobbling ringtone drifted over the heads of the other patrons in the cafe. Mr. Nobody hadn't been expecting this. His step faltered. He looked around wildly, clamped one hand to his waist. Yes, the rich had stuffed Gabby's purse down the front waistband of his tattered jeans and began running. Stop him! He's stolen my purse! bawled Gabby on her feet and pointing towards the man as he scurried away. Now, he might have made it out if he had kept his head. But the ringing cell phone had frazzled his brain. This cafe had electric sliding doors to keep the air conditioning in. And he had forgotten that it is no use running at full speed towards electric sliding doors. The sensors will not hurry for you. They will take their time. Which is why Mr. Thief ran smack into the glass doors before they could even begin to slide open. Stunned, he fell to the ground. Alberto and two waiters piled on top of him. Gabby smiled. Gotcha! She whispered to no one in particular. Call the cops. I'm pressing charges. She added loudly as she strolled through the surrounding coffee tables. Admiring heads turned at the snap of authority in the tone of this glamorous, sharply dressed lady. Taking her time, she approached the little thief. He had been hauled to his feet and was held securely. Gabby reached forward and in one fluid movement extracted her purse from the man's waistband. He was beaten. The misery of defeat quite obviously a frequent visitor to his face. Perspiration shone on his forehead as he stood drenched in shame. By now I had caught up with Gabby anxious for her safety in case anything physical happened. Although I'm sure she could have looked after herself just fine. Thought you could get away, did you? She said conversationally to the thief. He hung his head, a solely looking specimen, devoid of all dignity. He glanced upwards at Gabby and then quickly away. And in that instant, something passed between them. Something that even as a writer I find it hard to find the proper words to describe. 
Yes, there was the expected solely defiance, the pathetic challenge, the jeering acceptance, even some reluctant admiration, all that. And something more. Something primal. Full of hopeless longing. All wrapped up in wretched abasement at the feet of a greater God. There was a flash of response in Gabby's eyes, so fast that I almost missed it. But it was there. She leaned close to him. You'll be really sorry by the time I'm finished with you. She told him with a slight tremor in her voice. Oddly enough, the little thief seemed to relax at these words. Well, two cops appeared and took the guy away. Gabby promised to follow them soon and file a formal charge at the police station. We tried to get back to our coffees and normal conversation, but too much had happened. The next time we met for coffee was two months later. Gabby had been too busy. I noticed a change in her. She seemed... Well, to put it simply, she seemed happy. Not that she hadn't been happy before. Her life had been one merry-go-round of successes. So what had she got to be unhappy about, right? Ron. This was a different kind of happiness. And what she had to say quite startled me, to put it mildly. John, do you remember Lou, the man who stole my purse? Well, I dropped the charges. Decided he would be more used to me that way. I've let him move in. He stays home. My maids are gone. He does the housework. He needs to be kept busy, see? And he's a pretty good cook, believe it or not. She turned and gave me a slow wink. And you know, he's not bad at looking after a girl like me. I've grown quite fond of him, actually. But he knows his place. I finally found my voice. But Gabby, hey, the man is a thief. He's no good. He'll steal from you again, I stuttered. No, the cops know him, I know him, he's got nowhere to hide. Besides, he's got it made, living with me. But, but he's still a no good thief. Gabby frowned. I think that was partly my fault. She turned to give me a sly wink. If I'm going to be careless enough to place my open handbag where he can reach into it, with my purse right on top in full view, well, he was bound to be tempted, see? I was aghast. I felt my jaw drop. Gabby, you don't mean it was a setup, you... Gabby's bubbly laughter cut me off. Oh, come on, John. You know me well enough by now to know I always get what I want. She sang gaily. Well, each to his or her own, I suppose. And why not? I'm pretty sure Gabby and Lou will be happy together for quite a while yet. And what's wrong with that? Why, nothing. Nothing whatsoever. So there. But I do miss not seeing Gabby as often as I used to, though. Yes, I'm living you. Will you do it for me, Julia? Asked Harry. Julia Hodge shifted uneasily in her chair. Again, she glanced at the framed photograph 
of her dead husband, Arnold, as if seeking his advice. It was as if he was still there to comfort her, to stroke her hair and tell her it would be all right, just the way he had done ten years ago, before he had gone to war in a far-off place and got himself killed. Julia. Reluctantly, Julia tore her eyes away from Arnold's photograph and looked back to her old friend, Harry. I... I don't know, Harry, she mumbled. It's a personal matter for you to sort out. It's just not right for me to be there. It was as if Harry had not heard her. I don't know what will happen when I ask Mariah. I need you to be there. Harry went on. A stab of alarm raced through Julia. Harry, you don't mean you might? She haven't even thought of Harry as being a violent man. But then, why else would he want his friend Julia there if his wife Mariah gave him the one answer he had been dreading? Yes, I'm leaving you. Julia had known Harry for over a year. It had been an inky dark night and she had been driving along a winding country road to visit a sick aunt. As Julia had rounded a corner, a tiny rabbit had hopped across the road. Julia swerved to avoid it. Suddenly, the car began spinning crazily as the steering wheel became a live thing in her hands. Next second she was in a ditch, as red lights exploded behind her eyelids. The pain was unbearable, where the gear shift lever had dug into her side. Somehow Julia scrambled out, how she got out of the ditch, she never remembered. What she did remember was crawling out onto the road and standing up. Clutching her belly, she stood trying to flag down any passing car. Finally, one appeared. Far from stopping, it increased speed. Julia realized how she must have looked. A tall figure with wind-blown hair, swaying from side to side as if drunk, one arm raised threateningly. Only she wasn't threatening anyone. She needed help badly, that's all. Another car. It didn't stop either. The pale oval shape of the driver's face looked terrified. She could see his point. Only the movie extras in The Night of the Living Dead behaved like her. Another stab of pain lanced through her stomach. This was it. She was losing consciousness. She was going to die right here tonight. In the cold and dark and all alone. And then the lights of a third car came round the bend. Julia raised her arm again. It slowed. It went past and stopped. 
a man got out. A man much older than her. Are you all right? What a silly question. Another kind of darkness, more complete than the one she stood in, began descending across Julia's eyes. She was falling, and all at once the man was holding her. He was guiding her to his car. Why did you stop? Why were you not scared like everyone else? She asked the man who called himself Harry when he visited her in hospital. It was your face in the headlights, he replied. You looked an okay girl, a decent face. I can tell. Yes, Harry was very proud of his peculiar talent for being able to read people's faces. Harry had sat beside Julia's hospital bed. He told Julia how he had decided to marry his wife Maria the moment he saw her. Forget love at first sight. It wasn't that. Simply by looking at her face, Harry just knew that Maria was okay, that she would never let him down. Until now. And now, Harry needed to confront his wife, Maria. And he wanted Julia, a woman many years his junior, to accompany him. Maybe he was frightened. He really loved Maria. So now it was Julia's turn to be there for Harry. Just the way Harry had been there for her after her accident. No, Julia, it's not like that. I would never hurt Maria. Harry was now saying in response to Julia's earlier unfinished question. Right, replied Julia. I'll come with you, Harry. Even if I still think that it's wrong for me to be there. Maria had been cheating on Harry. And yes, Harry knew it. For Harry was very good at reading people. Maria and Harry had been married for twenty years. They had settled into a comfortable, routine coexistence, the way most middle-aged couples seem to do. Just chugging along sedately. And as we all know, this is where the danger lies. The deadly danger of boredom. The need to feel alive again in a way that can only happen in the throes of passionate ecstasy. A last gasp reaching out for physical fulfillment. Julia got up from her chair. Again, she glanced at her dead husband's photo. Is this what would have happened to Arnold and herself when they had grown older? Would Arnold have tired of her too? Would he have secretly found the willing arms of someone else, perhaps younger and prettier? Would Arnold have ended up cheating on her in the same way that Maria was now cheating on Harry? A sick feeling of utter depression washed over Julia like cold and dirty water. She turned miserably towards her old friend. Are you absolutely sure about this, Harry? 
she inquired. Harry hung his head to stare down at Julia's living room carpet. I'm sure, he whispered. It isn't natural, Julia. A week ago in the morning, Mariah caught me looking at her and suddenly pulled me close and kissed me. The other evening she made my favorite dinner, roast chicken with plum sauce. She strokes the back of my neck when I'm leaving for work. She hasn't done that since we were young and, and in love. His voice had become shaky. It's guilt, Julia. Many partners do these things when they are being unfaithful. It helps them to feel better about what they are secretly doing. It also fools their partner into ignoring any suspicions they might have. Julia nodded. Yes, Harry was right. It all made sense. Love is a fragile thing. It has to be looked after, tenderly, twenty-four hours a day, non-stop. Otherwise, it will die. And sometimes, it dies anyway, no matter how much you look after it. So maybe she was wrong never to have remarried, thought Julia. Wrong to have kept loving Arnold for all these years, even when he was dead. Because in the end, Arnold might have stopped loving her just the way Mariah had stopped loving Harry. She's bought herself these new dresses, Harry was now saying. She's taking extra pains with her makeup and even forgets to take it off when she is back home. There is this wonderful perfume she wears. It must have cost the earth. It's got to be someone at work, because she's very clever. She always makes it a point to be home on time for when I get back from work, so that I don't suspect what she's getting up to. Julia didn't reply. She was now feeling quite upset herself. Was this all there was to true love? Was love like a trapped bird in your house that was only waiting for its chance to fly away the moment you opened the window? Why, look what love had done to Harry. He couldn't take it any more. It was killing him, he said. He had to have it all out in the open. Even if the act of doing so in itself killed him. That's the way brave men behaved. And Harry was the bravest. It was what would happen afterwards that really scared him. After his wife's admission of guilt, the effect on him, because he wouldn't be the same man anymore. Julia was beginning to understand it now. Men like Harry could lay down their lives for people they loved without a second thought. But when it came to something bad happening to themselves, they were like everyone else. They needed someone around to lean on, to be there for them. And there was nothing wrong with that, thought Julia. It didn't diminish their bravery. So off they went, 
in Julia's car to Harry's house. Because by now, Harry's hands were shaking so badly that he was in no condition to drive his own car. Mariah certainly looked good, thought Julia, when they got to Harry's house and his wife opened the door. Okay, she was old enough to be her mum. But Julia knew that even her mum could still look fantastic if she tried. Come in, come in, Julia, gushed Mariah as she ushered her inside warmly. My dear, I haven't seen you for ages. Harry should be getting out more, I keep telling him. It's good to widen wide circle of friends. You know, make new friends, have a social life, have fun. Poor Harry could take it no longer. Without further ado, he took Mariah's shoulders and turned her around gently to face him. Taking her hands in his own, he placed them on his chest. Mariah, darling, tell me. Now, don't lie, give me that much respect. I can't take it any longer. I've got to know. Are you having an affair? Mariah's smile slipped. Who is it, Mariah? Is it someone I know? You've got to tell me, I'll understand. The words were spoken softly, but in a strangely flat and resigned tone of voice, like a man's last words, as the handman tightens the noose around his neck. Harry, why do you think? Shh! Don't. No. Just give it to me straight, my love. Tell me. There was a long silence. Then Mariah's shoulders slumped. She looked down at the ground as Harry continued to hold her hands to his chest. Two large tears rolled slowly down her cheeks. Julia was embarrassed and wanted to turn away, but she couldn't, thinking, so this is how love always ended. An icy calm had descended over Harry. He was doing the decent thing, giving Mariah time to find the right words. She hadn't been expecting this right now, not in front of Julia. I... I... Harry, I'm sorry, she whispered. Julia and Harry waited, frozen like statues, not daring to move. I... I couldn't help it. Still they waited. I had this dream, Mariah went on. You and I, we were sitting at the breakfast table, and you suddenly put down your newspaper and looked at me, your face like a stone mask, and you said to me, Mariah, I don't love you any more. I'm sorry, Harry, my love, but it made me panic. I thought it might actually happen. Slowly, very slowly, life began seeping back into Harry's dead eyes. So, you've been doing everything you can not to let your dream come true? He asked. Mariah nodded, 
fresh tears appearing in her eyes. Harry pulled Mariah close. Dreams are just that. Only dreams. He murmured into her hair. The atmosphere in the room had changed. There was something new and dynamic being born. A kind of electric charge that was making the air sizzle. Mariah put one hand up to Harry's face. And at that moment, Julia realized that something had happened to her too. Besides, she needed to give Harry and Mariah their privacy now. Quietly, Julia slipped out of the house as the husband and wife stood engrossed in each other. Julia felt as if she was walking on a cushion of air as she made her way to her car. Love did last. It could last. It didn't have to end. It could go on forever. Just like the love she and Arnold had shared. And she couldn't hold on to the bubbling, happy laughter that welled up inside, even as tears came to her eyes. Looking up at the evening sky, where the first stars were appearing. She shouted up towards them as loudly as she could. And I will love you too, Arnold, wherever you are. Always. Every dog has its day. Thump. Ivana's eyelids flew open. Lying in bed in the dark, her eyes darted wildly. Had she been dreaming? She waited uneasily. Thump! Thump! Ivana jumped up against her pillow. Someone was downstairs. A burglar! Well, obviously. She reached for her mobile phone to call the police. Wait. It was best to make sure. Supposing it was just the cat from the next door that had climbed through a window. Besides, she wasn't completely alone, was she? Ivana looked across to a corner of her bedroom. Gonzo Fat and heavy, lay snoring softly in his dog basket on the floor. Needless to say, he hadn't heard a thing. Gonzo was Alec's dog, Alec being the boyfriend she had kicked out a week ago. And in every way, Gonzo was just like Alec. Lazy. Overweight, a heavy sleeper, a huge appetite. Just wanted to lie around the whole day doing nothing. Happy to leave Ivana to do all the cooking and cleaning. Well, to be fair, Gonzo couldn't help with the cooking and cleaning. But Alec certainly could and never did. Alec never lasted in a job for more than a couple of weeks. So it had been Ivana who'd had to support them both. Plus Gonzo, of course. A wave of anger cut through Ivana's fear of the sounds from below. Why, Alec couldn't even be bothered to take his dog with him when she finally decided to kick him out. Ivana quietly got out of bed and put on her dressing gown in the dark. 
Cautiously, she opened her bedroom door, without making a sound. On her way out, she cast a disgusted look at Gonzo. His back feet haunches dimly visible. The chunky great head, typical of the boxer breed that he belonged to. Short, squat, an eating machine, just like Alec. Ivana tiptoed halfway down the stairs and stopped, her eyes liquid pools of terror, her heart hammering painfully as she saw the chink of light from below the living room door. Someone was in there. Cats couldn't turn on the lights. The safest move to make would be to go outside, get into the safety of her car, lock the doors and call the police. Ivana had her front door halfway open, hoping the burglar wouldn't go. Then he would still be there when the police arrived. He really needed to be caught. But what if he already slipped away with her TV set, her music center and her laptop computer? Why, right at this moment, he could be loading all that stuff through the back window he had come in through, enter his own car around the back. She didn't want to lose all her stuff, even if the insurance would cover it. The burglar had no right to make her miserable in this way. In Ivana's mind, there was no question about it. This burglar had to be stopped. Now, the police would never get there in time. But how to stop him? Or, at any rate, slow him down until the police got there? And did she really care if he was caught not? On thinking about it, she didn't. All Iwena wanted was for the burglar to go and to not take her few possessions, especially her laptop, which had so many expensive downloaded applications and family photos on it. Gonzo It was time that the useless dog was put to some use. Well, she knew she couldn't expect a great deal from Gonzo. Just like she had given up expecting anything from Alec. But at least she could make that idle dog try. Ivana phoned the police, told them what was happening and tiptoed back upstairs. She took one barefoot out of a slipper, raised it, and gave Gonzo a sharp kick on his plump buttocks. Mm? Gonzo snorted drowsily and slowly opened his eyes. Come on, you great lump of nothing, hissed Ivana. Go downstairs and frighten that burglar away before he takes everything that I've got. Something in Ivana's tone seemed to penetrate Gonzo's slippy big head. Things were not right. This woman was frightened and angry. It wasn't usual for her to wake up in the middle of the night and start kicking and cursing him. So Gonzo ambled reluctantly out of his basket. Shoo! Down the stairs with you! He's in the living room, 
go and get him. And just this once, do something useful in your life. Ivana whispered loudly as she placed her bare foot on Gonzo's behind and shoved him down the stairs. Thump. This time, even Gonzo heard it. He paused at the bottom of the stairs and looked back up and suddenly at Ivana. Coward! She whispered fiercely. Bedding softly down the stairs, she grabbed Gonzo by the collar and began to drag him towards the living room door. Gonzo resisted. Ivana pulled with all her strength, for Gonzo was a big and powerful dog. Gonzo's paws slipped on the polished wooden tiled floor. He slid forward like a skater on ice. Completely useless dog, just like your useless, good-for-nothing master. Ivana got out as she gasped for breath. I'm not having you around once this is over. She continued in a harsh, low voice. You just wait and see. Out you will go, just like I kicked out Alec. Steadied herself with an effort, Ivana paused to listen. No sound. Good. Very carefully, one hand still grasping Gonzo's collar. She eased down the handle of the living room door and opened it quietly. With her other hand, she gave an almighty tug at Gonzo's collar and pulled him through the gap, quickly shutting the door behind the big, slow-witted dog. The last glimpse she had of Gonzo was of him standing inside the living room, looking around in a dazed sort of way, with his private parts dangling down like bunched fruit between his hind legs. Ah, now make yourself useless, you disgusting creature, had been her final words to Gonzo. Ivana didn't pause. She ran to the front door, went outside, and locked herself into her car. Then she called the police again to find out why they were taking so long. Even though she was outside in her car with the windows up, Ivana heard the low growl like a distant rumble of thunder from inside her house. This was followed by a shrieking howl of pain, a human howl. Oh, come on, don't tell me that that useless dog is actually doing something useful at last, muttered Ivana. Despite herself, Ivana was impressed. Maybe Gonzo wasn't such a coward after all, she wondered. Just then, two police cars, one after the other, lights flashing but sirens off, appeared as if out of nowhere behind Ivana's car. She jumped out. In there, she yelled, pointing. You might still be in time. Two burly police officers charged towards Ivana's front door, and she barely had time to use her key to open it. Then there was silence.
Ivana had clearly seen the two policemen entering her living room. But now there was nothing. Not a sound. Ivana tiptoed forward and peeked inside. The two officers were standing beside a large, broken window. One of them was on his knees. He had plastic gloves on and was carefully taking a sample from something on the window sill. The other officer looked around and saw Ivana. Sorry, madam, he was already gone, but he seems to have cut himself on the broken window. We are taking a smear of his blood for a DNA test, in case we can match it with any burglar we know to be currently active. But we can't spend too much time on it, as you will appreciate. Ivana looked around her living room. It's a shame about that. Happily, though, he hasn't managed to take anything as far as I can see. Then she looked around again. Hey, where is the dog? The policeman looked puzzled. My dog, I mean Alex's dog, Gonzo. As soon as Ivana said the word Gonzo, there was a low whine from beneath the sofa. Ivana bent down and reached forward. Come on out, you great fat lump, she called warily. She pulled Gonzo out. The dog looked scared, its big eyes rolling this way and that, as its muscular body trembled beneath her hand. Just like Alec, after all, sighed Ivana. And there I was, hoping just this once, just this once, that you would prove me wrong. Gonzo wagged his stumpy tail briefly. He didn't even notice the policeman. Ivana frowned. Gonzo seemed strangely subdued and withdrawn into himself, as if he had just been involved in a major tragedy. What a sissy, decided Ivana. Next day, everything got back to normal, except for Gonzo. He appeared very far from normal. He wouldn't eat his food. Sometimes he appeared to be having trouble with his breathing. Until finally in the evening, he flopped down onto the floor and his entire body began to convulse. What was wrong? Well, obviously, the burglar had kicked poor Gonzo. He now had internal injuries, that's what. Scared by this unexpected turn of events, Ivana somehow managed to get Gonzo in her car and take him to a vet as an emergency case. Okay, so the dog was no good, but she didn't want it to die, Ivana told herself. Because deep down in her heart, she discovered a lingering affection for the animal. Because of Gonzo, she wasn't alone in her house. It was lonely without Alec, even as his faults were many. And even though it might have felt weak and foolish, Ivana had to admit that she missed Alec. And she would miss Gonzo, too, if he died. By the time Ivana got Gonzo to the vet, the dog's breathing was coming and going, in longer 
shuddering breaths, and he was twitching all over. The vet took one look and hastily put Gonzo on a stainless steel treatment table. A nurse drew a curtain around it and asked Ivana to wait in an outer room. The minutes ticked by. Ivana waited. She began feeling guilty about how she had treated Gonzo the day before. She shouldn't have forced Gonzo to do something the animal hadn't wanted to do. And now just look what had happened. Gonzo was dying. By the time the vet opened the door and stood drying his hands with a towel, Ivana had tears in her eyes. Is... is he dead? She whispered. The vet looked surprised, but then he smiled. Your dog? No, no, of course not. He's going to be just fine. Then what... I mean, wasn't he in a bad way? Yes, but he isn't now. Here, take a look at this. Suddenly, Ivana realized that actually the vet had been holding something in a corner of the towel he had been using to dry his hands. When he unfolded the corner, Ivana jumped back with a little scream. Minutes later, Ivana was on the phone to the police again. She then bundled Gonzo, now looking much better, into the back of her car and headed down to the police station. Well, yes, Gonzo hadn't been such a coward after all. He had bitten off the little finger from the burglar's left hand. The finger had become lodged deep in Gonzo's throat. The police had asked for the finger at once. They wanted the fingerprint. But maybe they wouldn't need it. All they had to do was put out an alert to the hospitals and doctors in town. The burglar would surely need treatment. It was only a matter of time before they caught up with him. Ivana sighed as she drove alone. Slowly, a smile lit up her face. Everyone is what they are. What's the use of trying to change them? She would give Alec another chance. After all, she had been wrong about Gonzo. So maybe she would find she was wrong about Alec too. Yes, she would call Alec back. Wasn't it at least worth a try? Oh well, if it didn't work out, at least she would still have good old Gonzo. Love and Respect Vincent Gordon, the faith healer, will be visiting Denton next Friday to provide a demonstration of his powers. All are welcome. The event will be held in the public park at 7 p.m. Rose read out from the local newspaper as Debbie listened. Well, Debbie, will you be going? teased Debbie's flatmate Rose as she put the newspaper down to study Debbie's face with interest. Debbie looked away quickly. She glanced through the living room window, helping Rose 
wouldn't see the confusion on her face. Vincent Gordon Vince They had all been at college together. All those years ago. Debbie, Rose and Vince. Vince was very good looking. His family was rich. He drove fast cars and was always flashing his money around. Of course, Vince was only interested in the pretty girls at college. And everyone knew that he could have any one of the pretty girls that he wanted. Rose wasn't pretty enough, so he never looked at her. Debbie was pretty, but she was very shy, and her parents had brought her up very strictly. This, of course, made things rather difficult for Wins. But instead of taking his pick from any of the other pretty girls readily available to him, Vince became determined to have Debbie. Why? Because Debbie was a challenge. Debbie was different. Debbie would be hard to get. And being the kind of person that he was, Vince couldn't bear the thought of any girl not surrendering to his charms. His ego was simply too big. So one Sunday, Vince sent Debbie two dozen red roses and a huge box of very expensive sweet chocolates. Naturally, Debbie's parents wanted to know what was going on, and Debbie had to explain. Be careful, Debbie, my dear, said her dad. We are not rich like Vince's family. Debbie thought it would be rude to send back the roses and chocolates. She actually rather fancied Vince. However, she turned down his invitation to an evening at Giz's Boudoir the famous upmarket nightclub where many film stars could be seen. However, instead of giving up, Vince became even more determined. So then, he began sending Debbie two dozen red roses and a box of Swiss chocolates every Sunday. And Debbie began sending them back. I don't understand you. Vince would put on a sad face and say to Debbie during lunch break at college, All I want is to get to know you, because you are like no other girl I have ever met. I'm not looking for fun. This is why you cannot understand me. Debbie would reply. We come from different worlds, you and I. Perhaps you should keep to yours, and I will keep to mine. It would be best, don't you think? Is that what your parents told you to say? Vince would answer. No, it is what I say. Debbie would respond as she felt a rush of color mounting to her cheeks. Even so, she had to admit that she was weakening. All the girls at college envied her for the attention Vince was giving her, and he was always polite. He never used swear words. Rumor had it, that he drank very little alcohol and didn't smoke. 
and Debbie had to face up to it. She had fantasized about Vince long before he had ever taken notice of her. There certainly was some sort of chemistry between them. Was it fair that the only reason she kept turning him down was because he was rich and liked to have fun? What was wrong with being rich? What was wrong with having fun? Why nothing? All she had to do was to be careful and stay in control of herself. Late one night, Debbie heard music outside her bedroom window. She looked out. Vince was sitting in the driver's seat of a beautiful, open-topped sports car. He had the passenger side door open. Around the car, in a semicircle, stood eight men in waistcoats, white shirts, and sequined trousers. They all had violins and were playing what sounded like an exotic Latin American serenade. Seeing her, Vince made an elaborate gesture, inviting Debbie to come down and get into his car. Debbie had to giggle. All the neighbors had come out to watch. What's going on? Debbie's mom asked as she opened the door to Debbie's bedroom. Oh, it's only Vince. He's being silly. He'll go away, laughed Debbie. She closed her curtains and lay down in bed. And after a while, Vince and his violinists did go away. You must be mad, Debbie, a neighbor said the next morning. Do you know who that is? It's Vincent Gordon. His family owns half the town. And you turned him down. I know, I know, protested Debbie. Maybe it was a bit rude after all the trouble he went to. The neighbor wandered away, shaking her head, as if she had just been told that little green man in a spaceship had come to live under Debbie's kitchen sink. So next time Vince invited Debbie out, she said yes. And yes, there were many fun-filled weeks with Vince. Parties, introductions to glamorous well-known people, Dancing, late nights, laughter, high-speed drives in several different sports cars, expensive presents. Even Debbie's parents, at first totally against the whole idea, gradually began thinking that this could be the real thing. And so... There came a time when Debbie decided it had to stop. Things were going too far. She was beginning to lose control because she was falling in love. And falling in love for a serious-minded girl like Debbie was no joke. Oh no, it wasn't something to be taken lightly. It was time to have a serious and frank heart-to-heart -heart chat with Vince. This, unfortunately, ended in disaster. Vince said that his parents would never accept Debbie and her family. 
that they had plans to marry him into another equally rich and influential family. That he had never promised Debbie anything like love. In fact, he said that all this talk of love seemed silly and childish. He said permanent adult relationships, such as marriage, had to be entered into on a contractual basis, each partner having clear duties and obligations and bringing equal financial assets to the union. That is what he had been brought up to believe. Love was for fairy stories. It didn't belong in a grown-up world. Fun was fun, and that was all he had ever promised her. Needless to say, Debbie was devastated. It hurt really badly, and she knew that she had been more in love with Vince than she had realized. All her parents could do was say, We told you so. And that didn't help in the least bit. Time passed. Debbie and Vince had long gone off in different directions. Then a global economic crisis began. Vince and his family lost all their money when their factories were forced to close down. He moved to a different, far off town, but despite all that had happened, he still remained very much in Debbie's heart. Right up until the current day, when her friend and flatmate Rose read aloud the news about Vince from the morning paper. Faith Healer? Debbie asked Rose. Doesn't stuff like that have a bad reputation? Isn't it a method uh, that conmen and crooks use to make money out of gullible people for whom medical science hasn't worked? Yes, well... A lot of people believe in it. Don't you want to see Vince again? Rose wanted to know. No, I don't. Snapped Debbie. Rose smiled and came over to where Debbie was munching her breakfast toast. Yes, you do. I bet you're dying to know what he looks like now. How long has it been? Five years? Seven, actually. Okay, seven. Listen, I'll come with you if you're nervous. Rose reassured her friend. And so, with mixed feelings, Debbie allowed herself to be taken to watch Vincent Gordon perform his marvels of faith healing. I suppose he's got to make a living somehow, commented Debbie when they got to the public park on Friday. The entrance tickets were extremely expensive. Security was tight. A huge crowd waited expectantly for Vince's arrival. Trumpet music blared from somewhere. A huge spotlight lit up a makeshift stage. A tall figure, dressed all in white, came striding out of the darkness, both arms upraised towards the black evening sky. The crowd went wild. Debbie caught her breath sharply. 
Vince looked terrific, so handsome, so elegant, so impressive. Seven years had not affected Vince. He looked just as good as ever. Debbie felt a fluttering in the pit of her stomach, and suddenly, she began fearing that her feelings for Vince were still alive. Her friend Rose glanced at her and chuckled. "You still love him, don't you?" she teased. "Nonsense!" muttered Debbie angrily. As she looked away, with her cheeks burning, Vince began speaking into a microphone. That same deep bass tone that had set her heart pounding all those years ago. Tears sprang to Debbie's eyes. She had so wanted to be over Vince, so needed. To have him out of her heart, so that she could make a fresh start. To find someone worthy of her love. And looking up at Vince, on the stage, Debbie knew that this now seemed unlikely. And she wished she had stayed at home. There was no denying that Vince was a very attractive man. Half the crowd was already in love with him because of that, so of course he was in a strong position to convince them about anything. Debbie reflected. Someone pushed a man in a wheelchair onto the stage. After gesturing elaborately. And speaking some weird words, Vince placed his hand on the man's shoulder and asked him to stand. The man promptly got to his feet and stood looking around and smiling in a dazed sort of way. More cheering. The noise was becoming deafening. A woman was led onto the stage. It looked as if she was blind, because she had her eyes closed. Vince laid one hand on her eyes. When he took his hand away, the woman shrieked with joy. As she opened her eyes, and turned to the crowd. I bet they're all stooges," whispered Rose to Debbie. "Paid actors. Many people in the crowd know it, but they are far outnumbered by those who want to believe that Vince can perform miracles. It's pathetic, isn't it?" "Hmm, I don't know," answered Debbie. You could be right, Rose. But just suppose he is for real—that he really can do all these things. Rose stared at Debbie in disbelief. You must be joking," she spluttered. It made no difference to Debbie. She had allowed herself to get carried away. By the enthusiasm of the crowd, it hadn't been difficult to let her foolish heart believe, just like she had let herself believe in things all those years ago. Rose was just jealous, she reasoned. Come to think of it, why didn't Rose's boyfriends last very long? Maybe it was because they could see she wasn't ready to believe in any man. Debbie told herself. On sudden impulse, Debbie turned to Rose and said, 
Rose, you've got to start believing in someone, or you'll never be happy. Rose turned and regarded Debbie with sly amusement. Just like you believed in Vince all those years ago. Did that end in you being happy? Debbie shrugged. Rose didn't know that the power of love could work miracles. Just the way Vince was working miracles right now. For heaven's sake, just look at all those people. Surely, not all of them could be paid actors, Debbie said to Rose. Rose smiled wearily. No, dear. It's all to do with hysteria produced by high emotion and excitement. Their bodies become supercharged. They can ignore the pain. They'll soon become disabled again when it has worn off. All too soon, the show was ending. Vince was waving to the crowd. There were many disabled people still trying to reach the stage to receive a Vince's healing touch. But he had decided that he had helped save enough people for now. One of his minders was whispering in his ear. Four more burly men began guiding him towards his waiting limousine. But the crowd wanted more. It surged forward, pushing into Debbie and Rose. Debbie stumbled and fell forward. A searing, white-hot pain shot up her leg. As she hurtled towards the ground, she screamed out, Vince! The sound cut through all the chaos like a hot knife through butter. The crowd paused. Vince and his minders froze and looked back. Debbie hated herself for calling out. But in a moment of excruciating pain, what else can you do but call out to the one you love? She wondered as she felt Rose put a comforting arm around her. It didn't take the crowd long to assess the situation. Some of them had got between Vince and his car. They were shouting at him. The mood was turning ugly. They all wanted Vince to go back and help the poor girl lying on the ground in agony. The girl who had called out to Vince so desperately they wouldn't let him go. So Vince's minders had to clear a path through the crowd. Debbie? Vince looked startled. Through her pain, Debbie managed an embarrassed little laugh. Vince, hey, I'm sorry about this but I think my ankle's broken. To Debbie's surprise, Vince's eyes darted sideways, this way and that, like those of a cornered animal. What was going on? Vince kneeled down beside Debbie and touched her ankle. Ouch! winced Debbie. Vince's head was close to hers. Now she saw that he was wearing a lot of stage makeup. Underneath it, he had grown quite old. Listen, he whispered hoarsely. Just do as I say, right? Give one of my men your address. 
I will send you a check. In the meanwhile, do your best and get to your feet. Pretend that I fixed your ankle, okay? Debbie couldn't believe she was hearing right. What? What are you saying? She stammered. You heard, Vince snapped. You've got to help me or this crowd will tear me to pieces. You'll be paid well, I promise. Debbie stared into Vince's frightened eyes and felt a roaring sound in her ears. She didn't sob. The tears simply rolled quietly down her cheeks. She felt a great disappointment, but also a great relief. And in that moment, Debbie knew she was a stronger and better person than Vince would ever be. And she also knew that at last she was free. She turned to Rose, whose arm she had been clutching. Help me to my feet, Rose. She got out through clenched teeth. But your ankle is broken, her friend protested. Yes, but I feel stronger than I've ever felt before, Debbie replied. With Rose's help, Debbie struggled up onto her good foot. Leaning on Rose, even though it hurt terribly. She placed her injured foot lightly on the ground, looked up at the crowd, held her head up high, and smiled brightly through her tears. A huge cheer went up. Vince was already halfway to his car. The crowd turned away to watch him leave. A man approached Debbie. Okay, how much? He asked. Debbie shook her head. Nothing. Vince Gordon couldn't give me what I want in a thousand years, she told him. The man left looking puzzled. Sit back down again, Debbie. I'll call an ambulance and we will get you to hospital, advised Rose. Debbie smiled. Yes, okay. But do you know, Rose, I feel better than I've done in many years, and all because I've just lost all my respect for Vince Gordon. Rose nodded. Yes, he's a fake, isn't he? Debbie allowed Rose to ease her back down onto the ground. As Rose began dialing an ambulance on her mobile phone, Debbie said, You see, Rose, some women love a man too much. Even when he betrays them, they go on loving him. What they don't realize is that Deep down inside, their love for that man has already started dying. Why? Because they don't respect him anymore. And you can't love a man for very long if you don't respect him too. So it was with me until a few moments ago when I realized I could never respect Vince. And in fact, I'd stopped respecting him seven years ago.